The first uh, speaker is Fiona Simpson, who's president of the New South Wales Farmers Association. Uh, Fiona, with her family, runs a 5,500 hectare mixed enterprise near Prima on the Liverpool Plains in New South Wales, which, those of you that aren't aware of it, is not only regarded as quite reasonable agricultural land, it's also the target of quite a deal of mining and energy activity. So with Broadacre Farming and Commercial and Stud Pole Hereford Cattle Operations, Fiona is particularly responsible for the administration, marketing and risk management of the business. She holds a Bachelor Degree in Arts <coughs> Business and has tertiary qualifications in workplace training and adult education. She was elected President of the New South Wales Farmers Association in 2011 on a platform of renewal, excellence and inclusiveness and Fiona is the first woman to fill this role. With her husband Ed and children Jemima and Tom, Fiona is passionate about ensuring a strong future for agriculture and maintaining a strong and united voice to ensure that the farmers' voices are heard and taken into account at all levels of government. So to talk to us about the mining and energy challenge for agriculture, please welcome Fiona Simpson. Um, thanks very much, thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the welcome to speak here today. I'm, I'm so the, uh, I'm a bit of a lover of, of quotations, and I'm all about planning for the future, and that's actually one of my focuses, is the need for us to plan, uh, the lack of planning perhaps that has landed us in some of the messes that we're in now, but I'm also a, a big believer in, in, in learning from the past, and I think that quotations often sum up some of the mistakes or the lessons of the past. And maybe it's just too much school debating, I don't know. But this is a, a quotation that's very, very well known. And um, I think that in actual fact it says it all. And uh, sometimes when we start planning around, <coughs> around money and, and the need for money, then we end up putting in jeopardy some of the very things that are, are the stuff of life. And I think that's actually where we, we fall into trouble sometimes. So today what I'm talking to you about is is basically the New South Wales scenario, what's happening in New South Wales, why we are concerned about farmland and the preservation of farmland and our ability to keep producing food in New South Wales, and whether or not, and this is the whole discussion that we're having in New South Wales at the moment, and I think it's a really healthy discussion, should we be putting energy in front of food in some areas if we do actually have to make a choice? In New South Wales at the moment, the community debate and the level of debate uh, amongst not just rural and regional communities, but also town communities about mining uh, and about CSG has really escalated to the point that uh, uh, probably four years ago, we didn't really even heard, have heard much about CSG. It's a really new entry onto the block. It's coming in a big way. And it's now uh, over a lot of land and affecting a lot of people who have never before been affected by mining or exploration licences in their lives. New South Wales farmers, since about 2008, 2009, has had some very, very strong policy on uh, mining and <coughs> producing land and water. And uh, I'll talk through some of that at the moment. But, but most of the failings and most of the conflict that we're seeing in New South Wales at the moment we really uh, think stems from not having this upfront plan. And we've been working very hard with the government, as have a range of stakeholders, uh, to try and get the, the government to deliver what we believe is absolutely necessary, and that is a balanced plan that uh, makes them talk the talk and walk the walk of, of food producing land and the sustainability of natural resources and will preserve uh, the ability of, uh, of uh, New South Wales residents and New South Wales farmers and, and Australian farmers, for that matter, to keep producing food into the future. Why is it a, why is it a problem for New South Wales? Well, uh, I'll just go through, and these maps are available on the government's website. It's called MinView, and uh, you can access them yourself. <coughs> and I'll, there's a few overlays here. So there on the screen we have the, the declared wilderness areas, national parks, and the mineral title applications. We then add, add on to those the current mineral titles. We add the coal title applications. We add the current coal titles. We add on the petroleum title applications and the petroleum title licences and also the rivers on there. So you can see that um, in actual fact when you, when you consider that a lot of those tenures are overlapping tenures, 
so people can have a mining licence and a petroleum licence on the same ground and they can have more than one of each, that in actual fact more than 100% of New South Wales is currently covered by exploration licences or, or mining licences of one form or another. So you can see why there is so much angst uh, in New South Wales at the moment and why we have seen such an escalation of, of angst. And actually, there's such an escalation that currently we have 1,121 current mineral titles applications and 94 petroleum applications or mining applications before the Department of Planning at the moment. Now, the government is very um, keen to tell us that they haven't actually granted any CSG, uh, new CSG titles since they came into office back last March, and uh, they haven't, but you can see that there's, and if I go back a little, that pale purple are uh, all the applications. So clearly there is a whole lot of activity that is just waiting to happen uh, if we can actually ever decide on a, on a way forward. And uh, that's the problem that we find ourselves in at the moment. There are six identified coal fields in New South Wales, and these six have 60 operating mines with about 15 more planned. And some areas, of course, are much more heavily impacted than other areas. That's, for example, a picture of Musselbrook. And uh, Musselbrook now is pretty much ringed by mines. It cannot expand any further. It is uh, basically surrounded by the mines and the uh, impending expansions of those mines that, that, that is planned in the future. 50% of the rateable area in Musselbrook is actually subject to coal mining. And uh, there are such cumulative impacts in Musselbrook that the community has major concerns about the dust, the noise, uh, the air quality and the vibration levels. And uh, the community now is extremely active in terms of wanting a balanced outcome for their community. And it's interesting because I'm not sure so how many of you saw Mo the, the, the Four Corners story on Moranbar last night. Um, but it, it's a community, I guess you would say, most definitely in crisis, and in crisis from the lack of foresight and the lack of planning. And I thought it was uh, unusual last night, in fact extraordinary, to be hearing a BHP executive saying that, you know, in hindsight, perhaps some forward planning uh, may have been good and may have avoided the situation that more places like Moranbar find themselves in now uh, with, a, with a large amount of fly-in, fly-out workers. Um, I think the residents of Musselbrook, despite many of them being miners, actually want a diverse economy. They actually want a stable economy. And they want a family economy. They want to keep their agricultural areas that they have. They do have some very sustainable and, and, and productive floodplain areas in the Musselbrook region. And they really want to keep those areas. And currently, they are actually uh, under attack, I guess you would say, from the expansions of the mines that are there. Agriculture in New South Wales, of course, and I'm not telling many of you, uh, many of you much, is a huge industry on its own right. So we hear about a lot about the dollars and the jobs for mining. But agriculture in New South Wales is also enormous. It's a $9 billion industry. And we employ 70,000 full-time workers, which is well and truly in excess of, of mining and CSG. And it underpins 12% of Australia's GDP and 11.9% of our exports. And the average farm business spends, on average, about $20,632 on natural resource management per annum. So we are, we are land managers. We do have a role in looking after the land and, and achieving environmental outcomes for the community and on behalf of government. And we spend a large amount of money on that as land managers ourselves. Unfortunately, uh, Nikki Williams, the, uh, the uh, ex-CEO of the Minerals Council, and I used to, to talk together quite often. And one of the things that she used to say was that God, God put the minerals where he put them. So we couldn't really do anything about that. Now, whether you blame God or whether you blame you know, all those other factors that come into account, uh, the fact is, is that some of our best coal and gas resources are actually under some of our very, very best agricultural lands. And clearly, uh, when you consider, and I think Ian was talking about that earlier, that less than 6% of Australia is actually arable, uh, and with a declining agricultural R&D spend as well, then we are going to have to, to produce a lot more food uh, out of a lot less land in the future. And some of these resources you just can't remake again, despite the best remediation. That's actually a picture of the Liverpool Plains where I'm <coughs> 
And uh, you can see that it's an extraordinary landscape. It's an, a landscape of a very, very fertile plains uh, with these interlocking ridges throughout the plains that provide recharge areas for the water to, and, um, and also areas for the farmers to site their infrastructure, uh, shelter belts for stock, etc., like that. And the agriculture of the area is extremely rich. We have very, very deep alluvial soils. We have high quality, high yielding underground water systems. We have a favourable climate with two cropping seasons. And we supply about 37% of the nation's cereal crops. It's very, very tightly held. And the, genera the, the people in Liverpool Plains and the Gundagar Basin have actually uh, contributed millions and millions of dollars to the local economy over the years. The trouble is, of course, is that underneath that soil, underneath that wonderful deep soil, is, is minerals. And uh, the Gunnar Basin at the moment is, is forecast to be the next Hunter Valley. And we have an estimated 500 million tonnes of high quality thermal black coal. And uh, what, what we uh, euphemistically call, the gas explorers euphemistically call, a biogenic fairway. Now, you geologists out there in the audience will know all about biogenic fairways. But apparently, they are um, highways for gas. And we know that there is a, a biogenic fairway underneath much of the Liverpool Plains. So, uh, you know, good hunting ground for coal, coal and gas. The agricultural yields in the Liverpool Plain mean, Plains, meanwhile, are, are probably nearly double the, the, the national average. Our wheat yields are around about seven tonnes a hectare on average, and our canola up to three tonnes a hectare. Sorghum yields up to about ten tonnes a hectare. Now, that's a high yield, but I can tell you in the crop that we've just harvested on our farm, we averaged nine tonnes a hectare over short fallow and long fallow of rural. So it's extraordinary, extraordinary agricultural country. Part of that, of course, is due to the soils and the water. And the soils are mostly of the black vertisol variety. And um, they're formed from alluvium and, and volcanic rocks. They're inherently very, very fertile, and they're very, very deep with a huge water holding capacity. And there's a, um, in the next slide, there's a, there's a, um, a cut out there. And, uh, the, the thing with these sorts of soils is that you just cannot rebuild them. So once they're actually uh, gone, they're gone for good. And despite the best remediation, I think uh, it's nearly impossible to put those sorts of soils together. And it's what makes the, the Liverpool Plains so absolutely valuable. The impacts of, of, of coal and, and coal seam gas, as we know, are uh, potentially on a number of levels. One of them is the water, and particularly with the extraction of coal seam gas. Uh, one of them is the reduced availability of the land. Uh, one of them is the lack of business certainty. So for us, uh, in, on, the, on the land, once an exploration licence is actually granted over your farm, so begins a period of extreme uncertainty, and an, a period where you really do not know whether you can invest in your farm. You do not know whether you can proceed with your succession planning. You do not know how to actually take your farm forward because the exploration period and the uncertainty goes on for so long. Now with mining and open cut mining, uh, they tend to, to want to buy the farmers out eventually. But with coal seam gas, generally uh, coal seam gas wants to work with the farmers. And so uh, the uncertainty continues. And certainly what we are seeing even very early on in the development of some of the Gunnar Basin and the Liverpool Plains is a huge amount uh, of uncertainty for landholders who want to sell their properties. Uh, and in actual fact, some landholders have been un unable to even achieve those sales at any price if they are situated next door to a pile of coal seam gas production site. We think that um, we, we actually have a very balanced position on mining and coal seam gas development in, in New South Wales farmers, and, and despite what I say personally, so do I. But I think we do need to be, if we're going to actually give the green light and, and let this industry proceed and, and supply our energy needs, then we do need to actually be realistic, uh, be fair dinkum, and understand the impacts of this industry. You know, these industries are both short-term industries, both mining and coal seam gas. They are both short-term industries, yet they, turn, they, 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 um, they will put a very long-term effect and they stand to have a very long-term effect on our agricultural land, on our productivity of that land, uh, and potentially on some of our water supplies. And I think there is nothing worse than having, uh, in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time, or in 50 years' time, 
uh, having sitting down and saying, as the, the BHP representative said last night, you know, with hindsight, perhaps we should have planned, you know, a little bit more effectively. There's huge discontent, as I said, and um, that that, that um, discontent, I think, you are seeing throughout uh, the media, throughout the communities. We ourselves uh, had a rally not so long ago, a couple of weeks ago in Sydney, where we, we marched with, with um, well, depending on who, who counted, um, somewhere between five and 8,000 people, and uh, a huge amount of concern about what is actually happening out there. As I said, our, our policy response is, is that we are not opposed to mining or CSG, but we do believe that you need smart policy to actually overcome the challenges. We think that extractive industries need to be subject to the zoning rules like every other industry and every other development that identifies areas where they can and they cannot go. Currently, mining has, uh, has trumps every other land use, and the Mining Act applies over all other land. So we think that it, it shouldn't be any different. Water, we believe, should be protected by an independent process before it is actually placed at risk by exploration or by extraction. And we believe that we also need stronger rights for landholders who are feeling very, very disempowered by this process. Since 2009, we've been working with the government to actually uh, broker a way forward. And we, for two years before this government's election, we actually sat with the government and uh, tried to, uh, and, and came up with their current policy and actually drafted their current land use policies. And uh, we and the Minerals Council all agreed with the government that we absolutely needed upfront planning and assessment. And that is what is missing currently in the state. Uh, we do not have any assessment of the land prior to exploration licences being awarded. We were very pleased when the regional land use policy was actually um, launched and was promoting the upfront assessment and was promoting the assessment and the identification and protection of agricultural land because we believe that with so much competition, with so many of the mineral resources underlying some of our very, very best agricultural lands and water, that without that sort of a policy and without that sort of commitment and without that sort of knowledge, that unfortunately uh, in the future we may very well wake up and find that our, our very best natural resources are gone and suddenly we turn from a, a, a country that uh, is a, certainly a net exporter to a country that is not only unable to participate in a future food boom across the world, <coughs> but may even have trouble feeding its own. So since, that, uh, since the government's come into, po into power in New South Wales, where we've ended up with is what they, what they are calling a strategic regional land use policy. And, um, and some of the things that that we thought that they were going to actually do initially, and this is the initial promises, was that, as I said, it was going to, to identify and protect agricultural land and require separate aquifer interference approvals for mining and coal seam gas uh, activities on a statewide basis, not just under prime agricultural land. It was also going to identify areas of the state where mining and coal seam gas activities should not occur and it would give the community certainty about not only having input into the process themselves, but being able to plan ahead so that they could make the changes within their community, so that they could best face those developments over time and not end up in a, in a Morumbah type situation. We also saw the need that currently in the state that it's sort of like a Dracula in charge of the blood bank type thing. So we currently have um, the, the mining companies must put in a, a review of environmental factors before they undertake uh, invasive exploratory activities. However, that review of environmental factors actually goes to the Department of Minerals, who are, of course are not terribly well placed to be assessing environmental impacts uh, or agricultural impacts for that matter. So we certainly saw the need for, for independence, and uh, and uh, the last um, the last plank that we had in that policy was about property rights. Uh, we thought that the landholders really at this at this stage in time the landholders are disempowered. The landholders have no right to refuse, and the landholders are when negotiating for proper compensation. It's very difficult because at the end of the day uh, they are negotiating in the full knowledge that uh, the, the court, if it goes to court, must award access because that's actually the, the, uh, the law. Have the current proposal, so we've come through that negotiation period and we actually now have the draft policy in place and unfortunately 
it's quite different to what we thought we were going to get. Um, have they delivered on their promises? Sort of, uh, in a funny way. Unfortunately, at the moment, there are certainly some drawbacks. One of them is, is that the water protections don't apply outside strategic land. They don't apply to exploration, and exploration, there are, there are still no assessments at all before exploration occurs. We believe that New South Wales is, is in a prime position. You know, we are now at the point end, before a lot of this development has actually occurred, we still have large tracts of very valuable agricultural land. Uh, we are still a hugely productive state. The industries have not yet got a foothold in the state. Now is the time to actually plan ahead to make sure that we are making good choices for the future, good choices regarding food production, good choices regarding the natural resources, our soils and our water. Uh, I've heard already today, and, uh, and it's in the, in the uh, AFI report, and I know there's been discussion about it already, the information that we have, not just nationally, but in New South Wales, is not good. Uh, in relation to, to land, to the potential, to the soils, to the water, to the land's capability, to the mapping, to the classes of land. A lot of the information that we have is quite dated and it has been held in different silos um, around the state. So we have urged the government consistently to try and allocate more resources, more people, uh, better mapping, better information, because clearly if we are going to be making some very, very important choices here, then we do need those choices to be guided by full and proper and robust uh, information and science. And uh, I think we are still lacking uh, in that regard, not just New South Wales, but nationally. Uh, I think it's quite well recognised, but I, I don't quite know what we do about it. Uh, it's interesting to talk to America and see what they've done and, and, and also other people, but currently there has not been a focus on agriculture in, in New South Wales for some years and the effects of that are now coming through. We also think that we, we need to understand that, that water protection is everywhere. We need to apply water protection principles, water licensing principles, uh, protection of aquifers statewide. Uh, and we can't, they, you know, underground water systems do not operate according to boundaries drawn on maps. So we do need to make sure that any water protection that we have in the state is actually statewide. And lastly, we certainly need to recognise that the risks and uncertainty of exploration, what exploration does to a region, what exploration does to, to landholders, what exploration does to a community, and either welcome those impacts or exclude them um, where appropriate. And I think we're in a community now, we're at a point where um, hopefully we can have these sorts of discussions and people will not necessarily say that, that or assume that you're anti mining or anti development anti anti coal seam gas or anti mining but you are pro food you are pro pro food production you are pro um, sustainability of your food production and planning for the future and that is certainly what the government says it is so uh, i think that we should demand that the government actually talks the talk and walks the walk of food security and um, and actually puts in place some of the measures that they talk about and I think that if we're actually making a choice with some of this land, uh, the only way to do that is to have the information, fully recognise the impacts, do the scientific assessment and then make the choice. Last um, quotation I have, and again it's um, quite an environmental one I guess, but um, I think it's very short-sighted. The way that the governments tend to run their, their um, the things at the moment is generally from one election to another. And uh, what I'm hearing from the community now and what I'm certainly hearing from our members is that the community is actually demanding a, a longer focus uh, and a longer term focus. And they do want the government to try and plan uh, some of these activities so that we don't end up uh, having to revisit uh, um, some of these actions further down the track when, when suddenly we have um, damaged our food producing land and our water. Thank you very much.